another material that shows anisotropy is the one that you would expect to show anisotropy, and that is crystalline materials. So we know that crystals are not all evenly spaced atoms. Sometimes you have rows or planes of atoms closer, other planes further away. And this is naturally where you would expect to see some optical anisotropy. As the E field comes in, the electrons that get pushed around by the electric field will see a different environment this way, different uh, effective force constants this way than they will this way, because there's atoms closer, and the, the bonding between the atoms is, is different. So you might think all crystalline materials would be highly birefringent and uh, show lots of dichroism. Well, they all are, it just depends on how much. Okay, it depends on the crystal structure and the direction of the E field. Sometimes it's not a real strong effect. But one uh, material for which it is a very strong effect is the most famous is calcite. So I have a calcite crystal here. This is a very fairly large natural calcite crystal. You can tell because it's got a lot of little defects in it. You can make, uh, get synthetic polished calcite crystals that are perfect for optical setups and you can use them to make all kinds of prisms and devices, but this is more of a natural piece. I actually got this at the Texas Renaissance Festival at Ye Old Crystal Shop. It was only like six dollars, so strange place to get your optical materials, but, but it happened. So calcite is very interesting because it does this. So 17th century Erasmus Bartholinus was studying calcite, so he was basically taking his probably his university ID and his big crystal of calcite and laid it on top, and when you look through it, you see double. And you don't just see double. When you turn it, the extra image you see moves around. Okay? So you can kind of see that there. Find something, here's the owl. So you can see the owl has two sets of eyes. And as we turn, one set goes around the other set. One image goes around the other image. To make it more clear, here's something less exciting. Here's just a dot. So you can see that dot is split into two dots. And you can kind of tell, it gets hard to tell when everything's moving, but one of the dots moves as I turn the crystal while the other one stays stationary. So this was hard to explain. Um, uh, if I saw this and had no idea what was going on, I would probably say I'm done for the night and go to bed and hopefully it'll go away in the morning, hopefully get some medical condition, but no, it was there the next day. So Erasmus said, well, let's figure out what's going on. And the main thing he did that is still applicable today is he named the two rays. The one bundle of light that comes at you that doesn't move is the ordinary, and the one that does something unusual is the extraordinary. So we still call it the ordinary ray and the extraordinary ray. So let's see if we can get some idea of what's happening in this calcite crystal. I'm not going to describe it in huge detail with this, the tensor and the, all, everything, but let's, let's get some idea. So the key is this is a crystalline structure. And if we were to do just sort of a rough drawing of the structure of calcite, this is not exact, but you would have, um, it has the carbons and the uh, oxygens in sort of a plane like this. So this is oxygen, 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 uh, carbon making kind of a triangle, and they're in a plane. And up higher is the calcium, right? So it's calcium carbonate, so O, 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 C. That's not really important, okay? So you have a plane here, and then you have this here. So I'll kind of draw the triangular thing, and then you go up to get to the layer of calciums, and then there's more planes and planes and planes. And it's not even this simple, but, but that's the basic idea. Okay, now let's think about what happens when light is gonna come at this material. So whenever you think about a crystalline material, you often look for one axis where there's not gonna be any anisotropy. So for that, it's this one. So this is the optical axis here. Because here you would have the E field this way, and you would have the E field that way, and the E field is going to be in the plane of this network of carbon and oxygen atoms. And you don't have much anisotropy there. Everywhere you look, you kind of see a bunch of carbon and oxygen atoms in sort of a triangular lattice. So this is the optical axis, the axis on which there is no anisotropy. Now if you were coming this way, though, and you had your E field like this, and then one polarization like this, then these see very different things. This one is pushing in that plane, uh, just like uh, the light uh, along this axis. But this one now pushes uh, b between the planes, right? So it sees calcium um, atoms this way. So it looks very different, right? So here you see very different uh, index refraction for this uh, direction of the E field and this direction of the E field. So you have a strong anisotropy if the light comes in this way. 
And this sounds kind of like, remember we had our phase retarders. You know, if you have the one right direction that you come in, you have one in this way, and you have one in that way, and you can call them ordinary and extraordinary if you want. But that doesn't clearly lead to two images. Why are we seeing two images? Well, the reason for that is because with crystals it gets even more complicated if you think about how they like to cleave and how, what kind of shapes you get, right? So you can see this didn't cleave as a cube. This made some sort of rhombohedral nightmare here. And the way calcium carbonate cleaves is you get this shape and you have sort of the dull corner, the corner with the large obtuse angles. That corner, if you imagine a, uh, an axis coming out of it, that's the optical axis for calcium carbonate. That's the axis normal to these planes that won't give you any anisotropy. So we can imagine that's sort of the axis when we don't want anything too exciting to happen. But if you look at this, it's not, it doesn't have 90 degree edges. So the flat surfaces of this are not coming in exactly like this. They're kind of coming in at an angle. So we have anisotropy. It's, this is how we thought of it for a phase retarder. The light comes in and the two optical, the two indices are, are perpendicular. But for something like this, it's more complicated than in this situation. So let me kind of draw what's happening here. Because of this structure, we would think of it this way. You have the flat surfaces and the light comes perpendicular to a flat surface. So that's like if we're looking through it and looking at the image of something under it, this is that flat surface where the light comes in. But the optical axis we know sticks out from this blunt corner. So those are not perpendicular. So you have your optical axis kind of like that. Okay, if you have both polarizations hitting it, you have one that's polarized like this, and I'll draw them a little bit separate. You have another E field that's polarized more like that. So if we think about this E field, um, it's, the E field is perpendicular to the optical axis, right? This one is not. This one is perpendicular to the optical axis. So that sees, doesn't see any um, uh, uh, birefringence because it's always in this plane. Right? It always looks the same. So that light basically just goes through the crystal and that's the ordinary ray. All right. This light here, this basically sees the different indices in different directions, but really we need to zoom in and think of it microscopically. If we think about sort of the imagined little scattering atoms on the front, what we're having is sort of one index that way, one phase velocity that way, and one phase velocity that way. See, it's not perpendicular to the direction of propagation or the crystal face or anything. It's, it's this anisotropy is now tilted because everything is tilted, right? Because the optical axis is going off that way and the face is this way. So if you think about this thing scattering, when, even though the E field is pushing it up and down, say it's, it's easier to push it this way and harder to push it that way, it's gonna kinda um, move kinda like that. And the light that it's gonna radiate will go off at different speeds and when they combine, the light will go off at some strange angle. That's sort of the physical way to think about it, is you're pushing the atom up, electrons up and down, but they kinda oscillate at an angle because they have this anisotropy in, in the binding, in, in the refractive index. So the extraordinary ray does this extraordinary thing, is it refracts at an angle, even though it hit the plane, the surface normal. So according to the law of refraction, we derived in the earlier unit light um, on glass, it should go in straight. But we assumed an isotropic index refraction. Right? It's not isotropic. Here, it's at an angle, so it goes off like this, and then it goes straight again. And this is the extraordinary ray. And that's why you get the double image. So this is a rough description. We can confirm it a little bit. So here we are back to our dot, and we look at it through the polarizer, or through the calcite crystal. And as I rotate it, you can see it's doubled, and you see the dot closer to me is the ordinary ray, because it's not moving. Right? It's not changing its position. And the dot further from me is the one that's going around. The dot on top is sort of moving. That's the extraordinary ray. So remember, the optical axis is sticking out of this blunt corner. And we have the um, ordinary ray dot at the bottom and the extraordinary ray dot at the top. Hopefully you can see those moving around. Right. Now, let's think. If the ordinary ray is the one with its E field perpendicular to the optical axis, 
it should be polarized horizontally in this image. So here I have a polarizer and I've marked the transmission axis on the polarizer. So we'll bring it in and look at the ordinary dot on bottom. And sure enough, the ordinary dot is um, horizontally polarized because that's the direction normal to the optical axis. And if I bring in the polarizer uh, perpendicular, the other way, that's the other dot. That's the extraordinary ray. So ordinary, extraordinary. So you can see both of them. Okay. And as you turn the crystal, then, oh, everything goes crazy. The direction of the optical axis changes, and the two go around each other through the polarizer. One shows up, and then the other. Okay. So you can see this extraordinary optical property in calcite is really just due to anisotropy of the crystal structure.